White dwarfs are the, or let's just take one step back. So, so we have the, the entire sky full of stars and all the stars we see are currently burning hydrogen in their cores, but well, most of the stars we see are burning hydrogen in their cores. And that's how they en generate the energy. But eventually they will have burned all the hydrogen that they have in the core. And then they will burn helium and then most stars stop. And so at that point, the core will be composed of carbon and oxygen and they can't generate energy anymore. And so the core just shrinks under its own gravity and the outer layers disperse in space. And so the burned out core, which is mainly carbon and oxygen, that is what a white dwarf is. And then um, in general, stars are always in an, in an equilibrium between the gravity, which wants to pull them together. So they want to shrink under their own weight and some pressure that goes outwards and keeps them up. And so in all the stars, that pressure is, is simply heat because they burn the hydrogen and that generates heat and that generates pressure. Now, when, 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 when they stop burning and the core shrinks, eventually it hits a quantum physical process called degeneracy. And it is that electrons um, can't be closer together than some limit. And that then provides what we call electron degenerate pressure and that balances gravity. And at that point, when the core shrinks down to about the size of the Earth, you have a white dwarf. The Earth size, they're the burned out cores of stars. They have roughly the size of the Earth and they have roughly half the mass of the Sun. So because they're so small, the surface is very small and therefore they're very dim and they're very hard to find. And that's where in the past, um, the, the first white dwarfs, they were found by accident. People didn't know what, what they were. And even kind of towards the end of the 20th century, it was still really, really difficult to find white dwarfs. And then as I kind of was talking about this morning, Gaia came along and because it measures the distance. And so you can tell that something is a faint nearby star in the foreground as compared to a normal star much brighter in the background. And so with Gaia, we're suddenly boom, just from one day to the next, we were able to say, that thing must be a white dwarf more that as a normal star. So, so well, like one really important example was that if you just sort white dwarfs by their color um, and how bright they are, you get what we call the white dwarf cooling sequence. Um, so because basically white dwarfs, they don't burn anymore. They're very hot initially, but they just keep cooling with time. And so as they cool, they become more and more red in terms of their color. And so we knew the white dwarf cooling sequence before, but we only had like a few tens of points. And with Gaia, something we had tens of thousands. And we saw that that cooling sequence splits almost like a fork into three branches, which we had never seen before. And we, 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 we started to figure out what causes that splitting. Um, and we realized that one of those branches has to do with the white dwarfs crystallizing at some point. So as they cool, the, the carbon and oxygen in the core forms a solid, just like water when it cools turns into ice and becomes solid, the cores of the white dwarfs eventually become solid. And so in that process, some heat is released and that, that leads the split off of one of the branches that Gaia detected. So that was one really exciting thing that came out pretty much on the day of the Gaia data release. That we looked at those diagrams and just like, what's going on? Oh, the surface is still gas. The cores crystallize, and that's why people sometimes talk about diamonds and diamonds in the sky because diamonds are made out of carbon, and white dwarfs are made out of half. Half of their mass is carbon, and that crystallizes, and so you can think of them as a giant sized diamond in the sky. Pretty much the vast majority, something like 95% of the stars. So the future of stars how they end their lives depends only on the pretty much only on the mass they have when they're born and we 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 talk about the mass of stars in terms of solar masses so we take our sun as the unit and stars with masses up to 10 times the mass of the sun become white dwarfs and then above that boundary and it's a little bit fuzzy boundary the core collapses into a neutron star 
or into a black hole. So the very massive stars, they form neutron stars and black holes, but nature makes very few of those stars. So most stars have masses below 10 solar masses and therefore most stars will become white dwarfs. So Gaia provides us a position on the sky, it tells us a distance, and it tells us a color. Using these three properties, we can say that dot is probably a white dwarf, and we can be quite confident. But to really learn more about the white dwarf and to do some of the other science that I talked about, we need to have a spectrum. So the spectrum is basically something like a rainbow. You decompose the light from a star into its different colors. And so the simple spectrum that you can think of is a rainbow which takes the, the light from the sun and disperses it into its different colors. And so because white dwarfs, they are, they're, they're still few that we know compared to other types of stars, like um, we know about 350, 60,000 white dwarf candidates. And in terms of stars, there's hundreds of millions out there, billions. And so there's still a very small number, and that means if we want to take spectra of them that are scattered across the entire sky, we would have to go with a telescope to go one by one by one, and that's impossible, it's too expensive. So since about 2010, I got engaged to the various um, spectroscopic survey projects that were being formed back then, and DESI is one of them, and that is to put really complicated machinery at the bottom of a telescope with optical fibers so that you can take many spectra of a field on the sky at once. And that is the king of all multi-object spectrographs because it can take 5,000 spectra in one shot. And um, the way we, I managed to get these projects to observe white dwarfs is that telling them that, hey, white dwarfs are actually really good for the calibration of your instrument because they have very simple spectra and so we can use them to do instrumental calibration. And so the, the, the Department of Energy isn't interested in white dwarfs at all, but they said, oh, a good source of calibration, that's something we do need. And so that's why they were happy to spend a tiny, tiny fraction of their fibers on white dwarfs. Galactic archaeology. So basically, because white dwarfs are the remnants of stars, we look at stars that have ceased to exist as normal stars. Um, if you think about the sun, the sun was born about 5 billion years ago, and in another 5 billion years it will become a white dwarf. If we look at white dwarfs today, we get information on the stars that they were in the past. And from the temperature of a white dwarf and the mass that we can measure, so those two quantities we can measure from a spectrum and the distance and so on, we can work out its age and we can work out the mass of the star that formed the white dwarf. And so that means we can use white dwarfs to work out what stars have existed in the past and we can investigate what's called the star formation history, how many stars of what mass were formed in the past. And so there's one really important thing about stars. The more massive the star, the faster it evolves. So massive stars live on the fast lane. They burn the hydrogen in their cores much, much faster than lower mass stars. And therefore, um, stars that are, say, four or five times the mass of the sun, most of the stars ever formed in the Milky Way have finished their life. There are already white dwarfs. So we only see a small fraction of the more massive stars as stars at the moment. Most of those types of stars have turned into white dwarfs. And looking at the white dwarf population, we can work out how the formation of these stars worked in the past. And that's an area which is very uncertain at the moment. We don't know how the rate at which stars form in the Milky Way has evolved over the past. So the difference to normal stars, we can see normal stars, like if they're like really bright, we can see them for thousands of parsec light years, halfway through the galaxy. Typically by dwarfs, we only see them out to a few hundred parsecs. So if you think of the Milky Way as a big disk, and we are somewhere here, 
we only see the white dwarfs in the neighborhood of the sun. Whereas normal stars, we can see them halfway through the Milky Way. So yes, the Milky Way contains a huge number of white dwarfs, but we only see the ones close to us because they're so small and they're so faint. Yeah, so the, the next big thing for white dwarfs will be uh, LSST, um, or the Vera Rubin Observatory, as it's called now, because um, Vera Rubin will obtain images of the sky over a baseline of about 10 years, and it will go five magnitudes or a factor 10,000 fainter than Gaia goes. So it will obtain much, much deeper images of the sky, and that will help to find fainter white dwarfs. And the way that we will be able to identify white dwarfs as opposed to other background stars is that LSST will detect proper motions over those 10 years, so we will see things move on the sky. And it may also detect parallaxes or do a similar job to what Gaia does. Um, and that will, push, um, that will push the boundary to how far we can see white dwarfs further out. It will still be fairly close to the sun just because they are so small compared to other stars. The thing that really got me even more excited about the topic is that about 20 years ago, some people, uh, it was specifically two people at UCLA, started to think about what happens to planetary systems around stars when the star dies and becomes a white dwarf. And they figured out that they had already found white dwarfs that have signatures of remnants of planetary systems. So they found white dwarfs which have an excess in the infrared. So there's more light than you would expect from the white dwarf at very, very long wavelengths. And they figured out that there's the disks of dust around them. And they came up with this idea that these dust disks have formed from asteroids or maybe moons or small planets or fragments of planets that came too close to the white dwarf. And because of the very high gravity that a white dwarf has, were disrupted, shredded, and formed a disk of dust, and that dust falls onto the white dwarf, and we can detect that dust falling onto the white dwarf in the spectrum of the white dwarf. And we can then measure the composition of a planetary body that slowly gets absorbed by the white dwarf. And so that was kind of when I got into that area, and I thought, well, that is really exciting because we can use white dwarfs to measure the composition of planetary material asteroids or moons or planets.